I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people that are the traditional custodians of the land where I'm located today. And I'd invite any of you who wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where you are physically located by writing in the chat. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to elders both past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone uh, that this session is being recorded. Um, and we'll, we'll make a start. My name is Kayleen Manwaring and I'm your host today for the first session in the Challenges for a Cyber Physical World seminar series. About nine years ago, I was first inspired to begin my own research on the cyber physical world by an article on pervasive computing in shopping malls that was written by a legal academic and an architecture scholar. The necessity for interdisciplinary understanding and collaboration in this area has only increased since that time. So this series is intended for scholars and practitioners for law, from law and other areas who recognize the need to learn about challenges in the cyber physical world from a variety of disciplinary perspectives. So on behalf of the Allens Hub and the IEEE Society on Social Implications for Technology, I'd like to welcome you all here today. Moving on to today's sessions on the Internet of Things and social impacts and issues, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Deborah Lupton as your speaker. If I was to list all of her, her achievements, I'd be speaking for the whole hour. So I've only have got some time for some, some severely edited highlights. Professor Lupton was a co-author of the recent ARC funded Australian Council of Learned Academies Horizon Scanning Report, The Internet of Things. She is a UNSW Sharp Professor in the Centre for Social Research in Health, the Social Policy Research Centre, and she's the leader of the Vitalities Lab. Professor Lupton is also the Health Focus Area Leader of the ARC Centre for Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society, as well as other roles in that centre. She has a background in sociology and media and cultural studies, and her research combines qualitative and innovative social research methods with sociocultural theory. She's written 18 books and hundreds of other publications. One of her recent publications in Media International Australia dealt with intimacy and sociality at a distance in COVID-19, which I'm sure we can all relate to. Now, Professor Lupton will speak for around 40 to 45 minutes, leaving 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end. Since we're a very large group today, um, please put your questions in the chat at any time and I'll return to them when Professor Lupton has finished speaking. So over to you, Professor Lupton. Thanks very much, Kayleen. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction and thank you for inviting me to come to speak at UNSW Law, my colleagues in a different faculty on the same campus, down the hill from where we are. Um, now, yes, as Kayleen mentioned, um, I was on a expert working group for the Office of the Chief Scientist and funded by the Australian Research Council on the Internet of Things. And uh, the reason I was invited was because I had been writing about the social aspects of um, digital technologies for quite a long time. So I was actually one of those people back in the 1990s who were totally into the whole cyberspace <laughs> discourse and writing about people's experiences of interacting with the fairly, when we think about it, fairly crude digital technologies that were available back in the early 90s. Uh, personal computing was a new thing back then. We didn't have the internet yet, but we had um, desktop computers and some fairly clunky laptop computers, and that was about it. Um, and I got quite interested as a sociologist and someone who's also trained in anthropology and media and cultural studies about how we were relating back then with those very early digital technologies in personal computing, how we thought about our computers, how we touched them, how we decorated them in some ways, um, how we incorporated them into our everyday lives and our workspaces, how people with disabilities were using the, the early forms of digital technology. So those were all the kinds of things I was writing about back in the 90s. 
And of course, since then, we've had a huge explosion in all sorts of digital devices and media and technologies. Um, of course, we've had um, smartphones, we've had wearable computing, all the different social media sites that have and Wi-Fi access and, and, and now the Internet of Things, which are basically smart devices that communicate with each other. But I will talk a bit more about our definition in a minute. Um, so here is just some of the recent um, publications, uh, the books that I've written about digital technologies from a sociological perspective. Digital sociology, the book there on the top right, was actually the first book, full book that I've written on digital technologies, came out in 2014. Then I wrote a book called The Quantified Self, and that was self-titled, sub subtitled The Sociology of Self-Tracking, because I was very interested in the whole emergence of the notion of the quantified self and the various devices that were being used and apps, wearable devices and apps and other technologies for monitoring oneself and what the implications were for how we thought about ourselves and our bodies. I'm also a sociologist of health and have been writing about health issues forever, basically. And so I brought my two interests together in digital sociology and digital health to write the book Digital Health up there on the top left hand side, which as the subtitle says, it's a it's a cross cultural and cross disciplinary approach to understanding how not only lay users or patients use digital health technologies, but also how health professionals use digital health technologies. So looking at a whole range of other people's research and as well as including a bit of my own research in that book. And the latest one is Data Selves, which came out last year. And that's where I really was able to bring in some of my empirical research on how people are monitoring themselves using digital health technologies, but other forms of self-monitoring. And used a new theoretical approach um, to think about how we might understand personal data. Then um, I've also edited a few books on digital cultures and digital societies. So the two books that look exactly the same are Outledge books, but they're on different topics. One's on um, just on self-tracking health and medicine. And the bottom one is on risk issues um, and digital health. They were both special issues for journals that um, Routledge published at, also as monographs. Then there's digital food cultures. I've also been interested in sociology of food for a long time. So I edited that book with my colleague, Zina Feldman, and then an edited book on the digital academic, which looks at, which will be relevant to a lot of the people listening here today, I'm sure, which looks at um, the way that uh, we as academics have turned to online media, um, not just to teach or to do research, but to engage in online communities um, using social media such as Twitter, for example, to develop connections with other academics, but also people outside the university. The, the role of blogs, um, MOOCs. So there's a lot of content, really interesting content in that book too, if you're interested in those areas of digital academia. But on to, that is my background. So on to the Internet of Things report that I'm going to focus on today. Um, that is the front page of the report. It's very easy to go on to the Ecola website and download a copy, a PDF. Um, it's quite a long report. I think it's about 230 odd pages long. There's a lot of content in there. We had to actually spend a lot of time um, reducing it down so it wasn't too long. And there's a lot of appendices as well to support our findings and that actually took a lot of work working out what should go in the main report, of course, and what should be in the appendices because we had so much content to work with. But if you're interested, do go jump online and get a copy for yourself if you haven't already had a look at it. We had a great expert working group from across all the learned academies in Australia and we had a representative from New Zealand, Holger, as well, one of the learned academies academies in New Zealand was involved. Um, the expert working group was led by the wonderful Bronwyn Fox, who has now been appointed as the next chief scientist for CSIRO, which is wonderful news and very exciting for her. She did a wonderful job steering us through the expert working group. Um, 
there's myself from the Academy of the Social Sciences, there's Paul Scutham, um, and you can see all the other people, I won't go through them one by one, of course, so there's the chief scientist there on the right hand side, because the office of the chief science, science scientist was the office that actually commissioned this report and it was supported by funds from the Australian Research Council as well. So we all work together from all the different learned academies um, with wonderful support from ECOLA um, to get this report together. So in the next slide, we can see the the other people who are involved, so the people from ECOLA who were helping us throughout and who actually did, I would say, most of the lead work and most of the grunt work, um, which was fantastic. They were a wonderful team, Ryan Wynn, Lauren Palmer, Stephanie Chan and Ella Relf. We had assistance from the Office of the Chief Scientist and they were involved in, in, in meetings with us and also giving us feedback on various iterations of the report. Of course, support from the, Chief, uh, the Australian Research Council, which I've just mentioned in terms of funding. We had also support from the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications. And again, they were involved in meetings and, and giving us feedback. And we had a wonderful group of um, contributors from all around Australia, from experts in academia and outside academia who gave us submissions for content that we were able to synthesize within the report. And we also carried out a number of consultations with community groups um, and with government departments and agencies and those kinds of important community groups and NGOs and government um, organizations, because um, that was really important too, we thought to really get at what was actually happening in Australia, because the key thing we were doing with this report was to do a horizon scanning exercise. But to begin begin the horizon scanning, we really needed to get a sense of what was going on in, in the current time in terms of the Internet of Things. So we needed to gather as much material as we could to, um, to see well, basically what the difference was between all the proposed Internet of Things developments um, you know, the, what I call the imaginaries around digital technologies, the hype <laughs> um, and the plans. And and really what we didn't know for sure was what was actually happening, what was happening on the ground in Australia. Because the other problem is when we read a lot, even in Australia, when we read a lot, a lot about the Internet of Things that might be academic um, analyses or media coverage, it's often about what's going on overseas. Um, and not so much about what is actually happening here in Australia. So that was a really important dimension to our report. And then we were asked by the chief scientist to do this horizon scanning basically with until the next over the next decade. So what we could see might be emerging as important technologies and issues related to the IoT in the next decade. So that really was the main focus of the report. Now we did have, we had actually spent quite a lot of time debating how we were going to define the Internet of Things because along with a lot of other digital, emerging digital technologies like AI or automated decision making or machine learning, there's a lot of um, dispute and different uses of terms um, and not everyone can agree often on what different terms mean. So we did spend quite a bit of time thinking about that, because obviously for this report, we needed to know what we we're actually working with, how we were going to define the Internet of Things. So this in, this is a, a box from our report, a published report. So we ended up defining the Internet of Things by a gigantic network of connected smart things, objects, enabled by data analytics and artificial intelligence that can make our lives easier, cheaper and more reliable. Now, something we also really wanted to emphasise across the whole report is that even though we might often think about the Internet of Things or, or the average Australian citizen might think about the Internet of Things really more as things like smart cities and smart homes, because they're, they're the sort of aspects of the IoT that have got most media attention and government attention, really. It does incorporate many applications across agriculture, across um, industry, across transport factories and mines, 
So they're not just about home devices. They're not just about wearable devices that connect to other devices to monitor and measure health. There, there is a whole range of ways that the Internet of Things devices are actually being already used or being proposed to be used. Um, this is another box from our report. We have had sensors for a long time, as in digital sensors for a long time. How and why is, is IoT a game changer now? So an, a number of technological advances have allowed connected objects to become intelligent sensing and knowing and scare quotes there because there is some um, you know debate over how we even define those terminologies. But basically, we are seeing a situation where more and more smart devices are being invented, brought onto the market and being applied in lots of different um, contexts um, with more and more sophisticated technologies generating more and more data. Um, and to some extent, we've got machines communicating with each other without human intervention. Although often there's a lot more human oversight than the de developers actually have us know about, but um, there are lots of occasions now where there isn't human oversight of data sharing. So that's a key issue for the Internet of Things at the moment. So here's just another great graphic from our report, which does show various applications of the, of the Internet of Things that are either happening already or being proposed in the near future in Australia. And there's also some interesting key facts about the Internet of Things. Well, there's many interesting key facts in the whole report, but this is just an infographic which sums up some of these key facts. Um, I'm probably not going to repeat myself by constantly saying go to the report if you want to follow up these issues, but there is really so much information in the report and if there's anything that I raise here today that you'd like to know more about, then I'm sure you will probably find a lot of that in the report if you get a chance to have a look at it. Um, I thought it might be interesting to talk very briefly about the hype cycle. Um, it's a very well known, this Gartner company's hype cycle um, is a well known sort of market assessment of where emerging and new technologies are on, on what they call their hype cycle. Um, so this was, I looked up what it was for last year for the Internet of Things and it's interesting that the Internet of Things as a sort of overall term um, is there at the bottom in the trough of delusionment. <laughs> so it's kind of a couple of years ago, or well maybe especially back probably five years ago, it was right at the top of the hype cycle because that's when a lot of attention started to be devoted to the possibilities and promises of the Internet of Things. But we, as with any emerging emerging technologies, Gartner constantly shows with the hype cycles, the, you, know, you, you do see technologies rise and then start to go into the trough of disillusionment and then they finally get a more real, realistic appraisal as um, companies, developers and users be, begin to see where, you know, where the hype actually might actually be able to be applied in everyday life situations or where, where it can't really and where the hype doesn't really uh, offer anything. So it's interesting, yes, that we've, we've seen quite a change there in terms of the hype that's been given to the Internet of Things. But it's still, as Gartner itself says, it still is really, really important. And if you have a look at this um, hype cycle in more detail, it actually talks about different applications, more specific applications of the Internet of Things, which are definitely still rising in terms of the amount of hype and attention and excitement that are around them. Then just as a comparison in terms of other emerging technologies in the last Gartner hype cycle from last year, uh, we can look at the various devices and technology software that are getting a lot of hype right now across the whole range. And some of these are part of the Internet of Things, for example, digital twins we, we talk quite a lot about in our report. Um, but it's also interesting to note that um, devices around consumer trust have become really important as ethical issues and privacy issues have received a lot of attention over the last few years in relation to any form of data generating device. And also how COVID, the COVID pandemic has started to affect emerging technologies and the hype that's given those. So things like digital vaccine passports, 
ways to monitor people's movements in space for epidemiological monitoring, contact tracing and so on, had very much um, started to make an impact on the hype cycle. Now we, went, we do have a few mentions in our report to COVID, um, but most of the report was written before COVID really hit us. And it was the report was published late last year, but it had gone already gone through a lot of um, revisions and um, you know basically editing uh, bef even before COVID hit us. So we were able to include a few reflections on COVID, um, but only only to a limited extent. Now, in terms of a social science perspective, now this is why Kayleen's asked me to come and talk because she she explained to me she wanted to get the social science perspective, and and as I was the um, social scientist on the on the Ecola expert working group um, and along with Jared Goggin who is also a sociologist slash media studies he's a fellow of the humanities academy so we were the two sort of Hass people on the expert working group and I have to say too I mean just just to add to that it was really great being able to work with representatives from across all the different learned academies and with Ecola itself um, and it was a really great way. We were, we were, you know, very much encouraged to see each other's views and perspectives and interrelate with each other. And that was, for me, a very valuable thing. And I know from other members that they also found that very valuable. So I think this kind of interdisciplinary uh, initiative that Ecola does is, is a really great way to do these kinds of reports that, that, that really can include um, a three-dimensional um, approach to understanding all the issues. So, um, so I, uh, Jerry Goggin and myself were, were of course responsible for overseeing what we did, add some of the content ourselves, write some of the content, edit some of the content. But of course, we were um, we did oversee what other social scientists added to the report um, with their submissions and sort of help with synthesising that in with um, some of our additions and edits. So that was our role there. So in terms of a social science perspective. Uh, this, the expert working group as a whole, but Jared and myself in particular, were really interested in issues around efficacy, but also ethics and rights-based issues and how we can be inclusive going forward in terms of what the IoT can offer Australians across the wide variety of social groups and geographical reason, um, regions that we have here in Australia. And what social science can add to this kind of report is a re recognition of complexity, context, social impacts, public understandings and concerns. And that's really gets down to the nitty gritty of what is it like to, to live with the IoT? What is the actual user experience like in detail uh, with IoT devices? And how does context contribute to that? So in terms of such issues as gender, age, what part of Australia you live in, what state, whether you live in an urban or rural or remote community, um, uh, your, the extent to which you speak English fluently, uh, previous digital skills, the kind of access you have to digital technologies, whether you have a disability, all those sorts of dimensions are really, really super important when we're going to think about what the IoT can offer Australians. We were really interested in which social groups benefit and which are excluded or harmed because we really were interested in both the risks and the benefits of the IoT that they, they, that they should be both looked at in detail. We were interested in trust. So how is, the, how is trust in IoT developed or disrupted? And that was a key interest across the whole expert working group because one thing that we really emphasise is that if Australians don't trust the IoT, they're, they're not, just not going to have anything to do with it. Why should they? So they need to be, firstly, developers and government agencies need to show that citizens can trust what they're doing with their IoT. Um, and related to that is how do publics understand privacy issues? Because we know that there are, can be many data, personal data privacy and security issues with any kind of digital technology that gathers personal data. So that was an, that was a, a key dimension of what we were looking at across the whole of the report. Um, we were also interested in how to be socioculturally sensitive. So 
So being very aware of the differences and experiences between social groups. And we were also interested in how do humans come together with non-humans. Um, I personally, as a sociologist, take a very more than human perspective on my research at the moment, understanding that humans are not autonomous beings that just go through the world not engaging with other living things or with non-living things. And in a lot of the work I write at the moment, I do talk about personal data and I do talk about digital devices and software as sort of coming together with humans in certain interesting ways. Um, so, but, but we also need to look at the non-digital dimensions of people's experiences of digital technologies and digital data. So how um, the natural and built environments, for example, are part of their experiences. Um, we're also interested in how best to work creatively with communities to imagine and design better IoT futures because we think, um, and that's one recommendation of the report, that there hasn't been enough um, consultation with Australians about their understandings of the IoT, what they would like to see for the futures of the IoT. We just don't know enough about that. So that gets to the key findings from our report and gaps that we noticed and immediately what was very obvious to us that there's very little social research that has been done on the IoT in Australia in terms of all those concerns and issues and questions that I've just been going over. Often when we read about the IoT as I mentioned earlier it's about the context in different countries overseas not in Australia. So there is a real there's been some you know the small pockets of really interesting important research mostly on the smart home or the smart city but for example, we just don't know how farmers are using, from a detailed you know, social perspective, how farmers are using smart technologies um, for agriculture. We don't know what it's like to work in um, a factory where there's been um, automated mobilities recently introduced in detail. So that became really clear to us. There's a lot of gaps in what we know about Australians' experiences and understandings of the IoT. And we need to know much more about how communities and social groups are engaging with, not only engaging with, but how they might be ignoring IoT technologies or discarding them. They might be trying them out and uh, but deciding they're not for them or they're worried about data privacy issues or they just don't fit the purpose for what they imagined. And I can tell a little story from a project I did that involved home visits with people living in Sydney, looking at all the different smart technologies that they were using in their home. And a man was showing us around his house and we were videoing it because it was a video ethnography. And he pointed out his smart TV and he said, oh, yes, here we got in the living room. This is our smart TV. And we sort of moved to the side while we were talking and we saw a Google Home Assistant sitting behind the smart t TV all alone and forgotten and dusty and we sort of said oh you've got a google home and he said oh yeah i forgot all about that yeah we tried it for a while and then it wasn't any good so it's just been sitting there for ages <laughs> as i said unfor uh, um, unused and unloved um but unless we've been going into that man's home and having a detailed look with our ethnographic work uh, we wouldn't have known about that uh, but it's one of those unexpected things that you don't know until you actually go and spend a lot of time talking to people and, and looking at the way and actually observing how they're using IoT and other smart devices. So in terms of key findings, what we do know, what we do know from all the research we did for this report, from all the fabulous submissions we received um, and the consultations that we undertook, we know that poor connectivity affects rural and remote communities really, still really badly. Uh, and there are still significant problems of digital access. Just having access to mobile phone networks, having access to Wi-Fi in many parts of Australia, even those parts of Australia that actually aren't that far out of capital cities, let alone in rural and remote communities. Um, there, we still do have major problems there. So already we have the problem that if we're trying to encourage, for example, farming communities to use um, smart agricultural technologies, or if we're looking at smart roads that can be equipped to be um, 
embedded with sensors so that there's better understanding of how they are used. I mean, there's just no way that can even start to happen until the Wi-Fi is there and works reliably. So that is really a key problem that's going to sort of really have an impact on how the IoT can flourish and be used effectively and inclusively in Australia over the next decade. In terms of Indigenous data sovereignty and challenge to, challenges to traditional ways of knowing and the increasing marginalisation of Indigenous groups and communities, we have a really interesting and important section now report about these issues around Indigenous issues uh, related to the IoT. And we would um, really recommend if you're interested in that to have a look we had some fabulous consultations where we got really important um, feedback there about from indigenous people themselves about these issues um, and one thing that really was emphasized by these indigenous consultants was that um, you know the the it gets back to this more more than human dimension that of course indigenous knowledges are very much about understanding um, traditional knowledges being passed on through interactions with country, um, through traditional modes of knowledge sharing. Um, and the IoT at the moment offers very little and in fact reduces that huge depth and complexity of Indigenous knowledge sharing. So a really interesting perspective and important perspective there that I really recommend you have a look at later on. Um, in terms of other communities, community awareness and understanding of IoT technologies is low in the Australian community. And this really came out, um, I mean, not only do we not have much academic research, but with our consultations with peak consumer groups um, and privacy groups, that's something that many of them noted in the consultations, that um, the average Australian consumer, if you were to say, do you use any Internet of um, Things technology, or um, what do you know about it, the Internet of Things, would probably struggle really um, being able to reply to that. And one reason for that is there hasn't been a lot of um, media coverage of the IoT, either positive or negative in Australia. And there hasn't been a lot of, and, and perhaps there has, but the, the term Internet of Things isn't used very much. So it's, there could be a problem with, with that term not being really understood or being used. So people might well know about digital home assistants like Alexa, they might um, use them or not use them. They certainly know about smart watches, they, know, they might know a bit about smart energy technologies if, if they use them themselves. Not that a lot of people do in Australia, but the general term Internet of Things is not well known or understood in Australia amongst the broad uh, public. Um, so that gets back to the fact that Australians have had few direct experiences, good or bad, of internet of devices beyond smart home assistants and those kinds of um, well-known technologies. And there is a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, there is some really interesting research that has been done on people's experiences of smart home assistants and of smart energy systems that's the um, and of smart cities but um, beyond that there there isn't very much academic research in Australia um, and as I've said media coverage of the IoT in Australia is low according to the uh, the groups that we consulted with like ACAN um, Getting back to key findings what do we know uh, and talk about in the report? In terms of the risks, um, the problem of smart abuse and family violence is a key issue that really needs attention, um, has been pointed out in countries outside Australia and to a small extent in Australia. So this um, surveillance by partners who are in terms of abuse um, and violent family violence situations is a really important issue that, that needs to be at the forefront of any development of IoT in Australia in terms of protecting victims of this kind or um, survivors of this kind of abuse. Um, as I've mentioned, most research has been on smart homes in Australia. What about all the other applications of the IoT? And another interesting thing to comment, I did mention smart cities, and yes, there's been a, a bit of interesting research on smart cities as well in Australia. Um, but 
to some extent, not a lot on actually existing smart cities and, you know, what the technologies are actually being used for in smart cities contexts. So that's something that needs more attention because there's a lot of initiatives around Australia, but they haven't really been um, investigated to see if they're actually working well or, uh, you know, do the job that they they, they promised that they would do. Um, in terms of COVID, I mentioned COVID a bit earlier. New raft, there's a new raft of surveillance technology for COVID-19 control and management. What are the implications of this? We weren't able to spend a lot of time on that in the report, as I explained earlier, but for me particularly as a digital health sociologist, I've actually been writing a lot about COVID recently, including digital technologies, but also um, non-digital technologies and I've written a chapter called uh, The Quantified Pandemic that's in press at the moment. Um, and I looked at a range of surveillance across technologies for COVID across global contexts. Um, and there's a lot of really, um, well, it's a combination of, of things like contact tracing apps being rolled out that are pretty much useless, like the fabulous one we have in, here in Australia, and but also in other countries, apps that are pretty much limit people's freedom of movement um, without them having any recourse to uh, what the app is basically telling them to do. So there's some really interesting issues around that and we can think about how, you know, what might happen in Australia, how far down that road we might be going with surveillance and COVID. Facial recognition technology, um, something that really came out in the report in terms of the social dimensions of IOT is the implications. We already know that there, in other countries, there have been significant problems with disadvantaged discrimination against people of low income, um, homeless people. Uh, there is a little bit of research in, in Australia based in Darwin looking at the impact on Indigenous people of facial recognition technology. And smart cameras in public places. Gendered engagements, we have some interesting research, particularly in relation to smart homes on um, gendered in differences in how people use smart home technologies. Um, and one thing that's been found by researchers in Australia is that um, if you bring smart home technologies into your house, it actually can increase <laughs> the time spent on housework rather than decrease, and it can actually increase energy use rather than decrease energy use. So that's some interesting findings there. And in terms of recommendations then in our report. So we do end up by saying, I suppose this is an inevitable, academics always say that more research is needed, but I mean, we really did find <laughs> uh, that we, you know, there was a paucity of social research and we really do need more social research across all IoT domains in Australia, because we need to understand the benefits and harms much better from a social perspective. We need greater community involvement and consultation to build trust and efficacy. We need to consider humans as part of broader ecosystems when we're thinking about the IoT. The IoT, of course, is its own little sort of ecosystem of smart devices and humans coming together and in some cases coming together with plants and with animals in ag smart agriculture, for example. But there's much more to say about that in terms of the the national context and the way that um, humans and non-humans and place and space um, and non-living things are coming together and data being generated and all those dimensions in the IoT um, ecosystem and the broader ecosystem in which it is cited. Um, we need to be far more considerate of human rights issues when we're looking at all these other dimensions. There needs to be acknowledgement of socioeconomic differences in needs and uses. So we did manage to point out quite a few of these, but this going forward, that's something that we'll need to be focused on continually. And one interesting thing that we did talk about was the possibility of development of education programs. One in, in schools, for example, around emerging technologies such as the IoT. And that, and there's I mean, I do a lot of interesting research at the moment that uses creative methods, gets um, young people to use their phones to do um, photographic diaries, gets people to use arts-based methods. There, there could be really exciting and interesting approaches that you could use in schools that would really generate student interest. Um, 
So, you know, we have some ideas in the report. So if you're interested, have a look. And I'd just like to finish by also, if people are interested in what I've just been talking about, I have, I did actually publish in 2020 in the journal Sociology Compass, a review article on the Internet of Things and Social Dimensions. So I go into a lot more detail there than I than we had a chance to do in the report, which was, you know, trying to do a lot of different things at once. But in this article, if you're interested in a review article on, on this, you can look that up. And there's also a teaching and learning guide that goes along with that Sociology Compass article as well, where there's, if you're a university educator, there's ideas for further readings and um, for activities in class with that teaching and learning guide as well. So um, I'm going to leave it there and I'd be really interested in your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much, Professor Lupton. Okay. That's wonderful to hear. Um, now, we actually, um, I would encourage everybody to put questions in the chat. We do actually have a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Han Ra Dr. Ransom Cooper and Professor Peter Leonard for some of the very useful uh, links they've put in the chat um, on the Internet of Things and some of the research that's been done, uh, some of the research that's been done that postdates the report. Um, and the first question, which is more of a technical question than anything, but I'll pose it to you just in case you've got thoughts about it, but there may be other people who have thoughts on this. From Philip Argy, uh, do we need to move to IP version 6 before we will see a more fulsome embrace of IoT? Did you have any thoughts about IPv6 or not? Um, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I'm not an IT person, no, sorry. No, that's no, the that's, that's, I can answer. <laughs> I'm no, a sociologist. That's okay. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, Philip, I actually would suggest that you have a chat with uh, Peter Leonard, who I know is on this call, about that um, from a more tech, although Peter's a lawyer rather than a technical person, but he does have a lot of, um, he's done a lot of work with, uh, people from a technical perspective. Um, so moving on to probably a, a more social perspective. This is from Saranga at Sydney University. Um, Saranga's point was many IoT devices by default connect to the internet, even if they don't want don't need to for core functionality. Some of the users deploy and then forget about it, but devices will keep collecting data continuously. Um, from a technological point of view, we know that average users usually are not tech savvy enough to find those fine granular settings to control data collections. Um, IoT devices are not that accessible compared to smartphones or computers. Um, Saranga just wanted to hear your thoughts on the level of awareness of IoT privacy among Australian users. Do we need more awareness and regulation or do we let it run and come to that later, like in the case of what happened with smartphones? Oh, we have a lot to say in the report about regulation that was offered by very, very, um, you know, um, effective legal minds, um, uh, submissions in particular, we had a lot of really great submissions. I'm not a legal scholar, so I can't talk about regulation. But what I can tell you that I have done a lot of research over the past decade on Australians uses of all sorts of digital technologies. And I and I always have a question it doesn't matter what the interview is about, what device or technology is or practice that it's about. I always have a question about, are you concerned about your personal data and where it goes? If not, why? If yes, why? And please explain. Because I'm, you know, qualitative researcher, so I, I do actually get to talk to people and get them to expand on that. And time and time again, across, doesn't matter what the age group is, doesn't matter what the context is, most people don't know and don't care, basically, if you want to put it in, <laughs> in a meme. Don't know, don't care. Thanks. So, um, yes, they, they, and I think, I, I just to expand on that, and my reflection on that is that um, that's because most people haven't had, I mean, some people have, of course, but most people haven't had direct experience where they know that they know about where they've had their data breached or leaked or hacked or exploited um, or they they do I mean other research I've done shows that pick for example on Facebook I did a I did a project on Facebook six months after the Cambridge Analytica 
revelations and scandal, which got a huge amount of media attention in our country and also, you know, globally. So I was interested in how people who used Facebook were responding to the massive amount of bad publicity Facebook got at that time. And even though it was only less than six months after Cambridge Analytica, um, and I, it was just interviews with people about why do you use Facebook? What do you like about Facebook? What don't you like about Facebook? Hardly anyone talked about data privacy issues. No one mentioned Cambridge Analytica or Facebook, you know, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. And um, people just accept to some extent that they know that their data are being sold or being used for target advertising. You can't avoid noticing that when you use Facebook. They also can see how crappy the target advertising is and how inaccurate it can often be. So they're not particularly worried by it. It's a, there's lots of different reasons. I could probably just spend a whole presentation talking about Australians' understandings and practices related to data, data privacy, but the short answer is don't know, don't care. Thanks for that, very, thanks for that um, Professor Lupton. I'd just like to add to that in the sense that I know that there are current research projects going on that relate to um, awareness of IoT privacy, um, particularly at Deakin University with um, Ian Warren and Monique Mann. I know Ian's on this call, I'm not sure Monique is, um, and they're, they're, they should be um, delivering some work soon. That's been funded by, by ACAN. And I also think that the project, although I'll, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, that's being run by David Lindsay, Ivana Wright, um, and Genevieve Wilson at UTS at the moment deals with that to some extent. I know that in my own work, I've done a summary of um, a lot of research that's been done, not so much by academics, but um, by uh, some of the regulators like the OAIC, the ACCC, the, Confu oh, the Confu Consumer Policy Research Centre has done some work too on um, levels of awareness generally, although that's less focused on um, IoT. So there is some more coming out at the moment. Um, and I know some of the Consumer Policy Research Centre is not is less so on the, the, there's a lot on the don't know, and there's some on the don't know, don't care, but there's also some um, work on not so much don't care as, well, it is a don't care, but it's a don't care because they feel that there's a form of learned helplessness happening where they're just going, it's not going to make, I, I can't change anything. Um, uh, even if I do care, so I refuse to care about this thing that I can't change. Um, but anyway, just to move on from that, um, there is some, so we're getting some very interesting um, questions and comments. Um, from Sri Rahajo, wanted to know if there's any research regarding the benefit of IoT for elder people in society. Uh, in Australia? Um, I would think Australia or generally. Uh, well, this report did focus on Australia. Um, so um, the, the, the details that we have in Australia, you know, in Australia are, are limited, but, um, and again, remember I'm talking about social research mm. as well. Um, so I know that there's a small amount of research on that, but not a huge amount. Mm. My colleague, Sarah Pink does is currently doing some really interesting ethnographic work involving visits to, to older people's homes in rural New South Wales, uh, no, rural Victoria, I think, or it could be New South Wales or both, um, talking to them about their use of IoT devices like um, robo, robot vacuum cleaners and things and, and home, digital home assistants. So she's, I've seen a report that she produced recently she and her team did also, um, including Yolanda Stringers, did um, provide a submission for the this report. So there, there'd be material from their previous research that was included in in the report. So they're one of the we're one of the groups that that gave an excellent contribution to the content of the report, but are also continuing to do some really interesting work around smart home devices across different age groups in Australia. So if you're interested, uh, do look up their work, Sarah Pink, Yolanda Stringer's work, and see what they're doing right now. Oh, 
Thank you. Um, just a, a another point to do with that. One of the great things about the Ecola report is that because they had to synthesise it into such a small, a, well, relatively small piece, considering the amount of materials out there, what you'll also find on the uh, website is links to all of the submissions as well. So if there's an area that isn't that's mentioned but not necessarily covered in great detail in the report you can go down and have a look at the submissions and it might be in much there might be material in a lot more detail set out there it's right down the bottom of the it's called the input papers and it's right down the bottom of the website um, and I found that very useful when I've looked at the report and going oh this is really useful but there's only two paragraphs so I need to know more um, now, we next have a question of um, from Bronwyn Morgan. Um, you mentioned the broader ecosystem at one point, and I wonder whether there is any attention being paid to the environmental and energy infrastructure that seems to be assumed as part of the growth of the I IoT. It seems to have equally low visibility to social dimensions. Um, yes, that's that's true. And um, I did uh, talk uh, in the beginning part of the talk about problems also with Wi-Fi access and those kinds of basic infrastructural issues around digital technology and yeah, um, reliable electricity despite um, provision, that kind of infrastructure is clearly important as well um, to support IoT. Um, in areas where currently that can't be guaranteed. Yes, definitely agree. Um, we do we do cover some of that in the report. Yes, but yes, I agree. It's very, very important. Just basic infrastructural. I mean, I'll draw an, an analogy here too, actually, because it's a really important point. So I'm on another expert working group for a commission on global health. Um, with peak bodies in global health, such as the WHO and UNICEF and OECD and various fantastic organisations. And uh, we're looking particularly at young people's use of digital health across the globe, and particularly in countries with um, high levels of young younger people, which we don't have in Australia, but of course many low-income countries do have. And um, basically, we, we have to say time and again in our report there that it's all very well to say oh digital health look what we can offer you know got all these amazing technologies out there to offer better universal health coverage but in many of the areas that we're covering and talking about in our report nobody owns a smartphone let alone has wi-fi access so i mean how on earth can you offer them any kind of digital health basically what they need is clean water better sanitation and vaccinations <laughs> so um I guess that's just part of, uh, I, I finished by talking about the broader ecosystem in which devices and technologies are used. I mean, that really does, those kinds of infra basic infrastructural aspects of people's experiences or non-experience with digital tech needs to be acknowledged all the time. Thanks very much. Um, now we're going to move on to, um, and very much fitting with the theme of the whole series, not only with the work that's been done in relation to the Ecola report. Um, and I do note that uh, Ecola has just welcomed a new Learned Academy to its ranks, which is great to see. Um, and this is from Ian Warren, um, who says, thanks for the very interesting and useful presentation, Deborah. My question is a little bit more structural in terms of how research on IoT should be done. How should an interdisciplinary examination of IOTs ideally be conducted? My emphasis being on engaging people from different disciplines involving social sciences, law and regulation. So, so the question is how to do that research? Yes, <laughs> it's a very big question. <laughs> Probably some tips well, on what you, how to do it and possibly any tips on how not to do it considering your last, uh, considering the um, the scope of the Ecola um, work, if there's things that you learned um, from that? Um, well, I guess the Ecola report was a bit different because it wasn't actually an applied kind of empirical, you know, social research project. Um, it was very much uh, based on consultations and um, 
approaches that I'd done often use in my own research for you know, academic research, but which in the end was, was an incredibly useful way to do things. Um, I would f first say that one of the, and I just put another report I, that I was involved with up on the chat too, which was with my colleagues in the Centre for Social Research and Health, because it actually looks at marginalised communities in Australia and what they think about, and they're trusting the data that are generated by digital health technologies in case anyone's interested in those issues. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the things I do with my Vitalities Lab and also with the, the group of researchers with the Centre of Excellence for Domain Decision Making and Society is we like to experiment with lots of digital and non-digital methods for research. Um, we're really interested in people's emotional responses to digital technologies, to the multi-sensory engagements they have with them. And where and interviews and you know your standard interview, your standard survey, we don't do a lot of quant stuff, but sometimes we do. But um, what we really like to do is, as I mentioned earlier, watch what people do from an ethnographic perspective, as well as talk to them about what they do, get them to explain you know, as they handle digital technologies, get them to explain what it is that they're, um, what, how they use them or don't use them, as they show show us around their homes, as I mentioned, the poor old Google Home Assistant hiding behind the smart TV, you know, they'd forgotten about it. We would never have known about it unless we'd been there in the home. Um, so, I mean, you know, these methods aren't for everyone, but, but for me and my teams of researchers, we are finding that those kinds of really hands-on observational methods, also methods where you get people, uh, you come at people from a bit of an angle. So for example, the classic surveys that I've seen time and time again, when you talk to people about their say digital privacy issues, are you concerned about your digital privacy? Well, most people would say yes, wouldn't they? Because they know that's the issue, you know, that's the expected response. But you don't, really know what they mean by that. If, yes, I'm concerned or very concerned or a little bit concerned. You really need to, to go beyond that and, and find out exactly what it is they're concerned about because it's a huge, you know, the whole digital privacy covers so many different devices, so many uses, so many contexts. In some contexts, they may not care less about it, as in, for example, Facebook use. In other cases, as we found with that in that report I just put up on the chat with people in marginalised communities who are seeing healthcare providers and aren't keen on using my health record because they are stigmatised and marginalised and get treated differently by doctors if those doctors know they are transgender or if those doctors know that they are a sex worker. But those same people may be perfectly happy to go onto Facebook and talk about those issues. If you see what I mean, it's, I mean, it really, I think that any, any research, if you really want to get at the understandings and practices that people have in the context of that and the complexity and the diversity of that, you've got to get beyond your simple survey. A simple survey is great for just getting a few quant metrics, but really understanding what's going on in people's lives. Um, well, I, I just recommend doing really in depth work that could involve asking people about things from a bit of a bleak angle. So rather than just directly saying, for, in our Facebook research, we I didn't we didn't mention Cambridge Analytica. I wanted to see if they would mention it. I mean, if I had mentioned it, they might have said, oh, yes, that really worried me. But the fact that I didn't mention it and they, and they didn't either was really interesting, I thought. So going about things a bit indirectly, I think can, you can often get richer and more insightful findings. So that's my little soapbox, I guess. <laughs> Thank just, you. I've just harangued you all. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, Ian says it's very useful. And personally, that sounds like an incredibly valuable insight into some of the qualitative research methods that social scientists use. And, um, and it increasingly, of course, used in socio-legal research in the legal academy. I'm not a socio-legal researcher myself, but there are a number of socio-legal researchers and it's becoming much more important in law schools across across the country and across the world, in fact. 
Um, well, I think you'd like to, uh, we'll have to wrap it up there because it's two o'clock. So I'd like to, for everybody to thank um, Professor Lupton for her time and energy and her soapbox. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, all of the wonderful people in the chat who've um, been sharing their own expertise on particular issues. And that's a, um, a benefit I hadn't thought about in uh, having an interdisciplinary series around the fact that people are being able to make um, provide that sort of information in the chat. Um, so thank you very much.